Thanks for your patience. Um, you want to say that why we why I'm here instead? Yeah, of, yeah. I'll do a few announcements. Do you want to send a third? Yeah. Okay. We're recording it. We're recording. <laughs> well, welcome to the first Citizens Planning Academy session of 2018. Um, we're glad you could be here. Um, we do this. Uh, once a month, it's always the first Wednesday of the month, except for July, in this location at 6 o'clock. And we have experts from our community come in and talk about planning topics to help you become more effective advocates for the things you care about in your community. I did want to give a little plug. Tomorrow is Idaho Gives, and Idaho Smart Growth is fundraising to support this program during Idaho Gives. So if you have been coming and you enjoy it and you feel inclined to give, please do so. We do have a board match. Um, going on as well, so your donation will go twice as far. Um, our next session is in June. It's going to be on turning green, how communities can plan for sustainability with Sharon Patterson Grant. And uh, we appreciate everyone's flexibility tonight, um, having to reschedule Renee. Um, I expect that we'll get her back in November, so if you're interested in historic preservation, we'll, we'll get that topic back on the schedule. And we really appreciate Yap Bath uh, stepping in and speaking on cheap and easy ways to make Boise bike friendly. Yap is the director of the Urban Design Center at the University of Idaho and a professor in the Bioregional and Community um, Design, design Program. <laughs> yes, thank you. So I'm deliberately going to stand here to see if they can actually pick up the sound now. Um, <laughs> all right, so this is actually a presentation I gave a week ago. And the university started this process called Vandal Voices where uh, different professors from the university give a presentation in Boise Brewing. Uh, so this was what I did in Boise Brewing, although I've updated it because out of that came some changes and some ideas that people had to do some different things. So I call this a lighthearted look at road designs that meet the requirements in a handboot that makes you seriously question the sanity of traffic engineers. Um, and I'm going to show you a bunch of stuff that from a pers perspective of a bike or a pedestrian just doesn't make any kind of sense and could actually easily be fixed. So here is my little disclaimer. I'm Dutch, <laughs> right, which explains my biking. Bike since I was three years old. Uh, my first bike was a tiny little blue bike. Uh, the only thing I like better than biking is skating and uh, raw herring. <laughs> <laughs> it's delicious. I'm going to Amsterdam in the, uh, in the next month, and I, that's the first thing I will get as soon as I get off the airport, I get myself some herring. All right, so bikes and the Dutch. The average Dutch person uses a bike about 300 times a year. Just imagine that 300 times a year, people go in a bike. 27% um, of all trips in the Netherlands are by bike. And biking is expected to continue to increase in the Netherlands. Now, here's some ideas that, that I can show you here. So this is for a specific city, 2004, 2006, and I know you can't understand a word of this because it's all in dots. The green is the bike, blue is cars, and red is public transit. And, and then 2010, 2011, you see the amount of uh, bikes goes up a little bit. Uh, public transit remains the same, and then the goal in 2015 is to get to this part, where almost half of the trips are actually make, made by bike. And what I always think interesting about this is when people think about Europe has so much public transit, yes, that's true, but the reality is that it's the bike more than anything else, especially inside a city that makes a difference. So here is the same picture for outside, so this is between cities. And you see that between cities, public transit is obviously more important than it is internal. And you see the car is way more important. Um, and, and the thing that is interesting to me here is that it's a mix of transportation modes. It's not just biking, it's not just public transit, it's not just a car, it's having a choice about what you want to use, right? And that's what this really shows. And then this is what they ultimately uh, wanted to, oh, go back. This is what they ultimately want to get to total. So internal and external. So the bike is really an internal transportation mode in the network. All right, so I want to show you this one. The Dutch are biking more often and longer distances. Um, and so this is less, and this is just, uh, they don't know what this over, over the means the rest. <laughs> um, more often they go to education, less shopping, more for recreation, and more often for work. Uh, and they go further for different things. They go further for uh, education, further for uh, 
shopping, further for recreation, and further for uh, going to work. Uh, this is more people, and this is the total. So the idea is we're not only having more people, they're also going longer distances. They're using the bike more often and they're going further with it. Now, <clears throat> let's go back. Who do you think is, where do you see the increase with bikes? Who is biking more? Here or there? There. Where do you think you see the greatest increase? Why are people biking further and why are more people biking? You, you techie guys can tell me too, okay? Oh, I think because they have better infrastructure for it. No. No? No. There's another reason. Well, let's ask who is biking more, you think? Well, everybody thinks it's cheaper. All right, everybody? Like you can't park and you can't buy gas. I mean, you don't, you don't have to worry about those issues. Right. You're not a bike. Okay. <clears throat> so, so the people that are biking more are old people like my 78 year old mother. And the reason for that is because of the e-bike. So there are more and more bikes that have a little electric engine with it. And, even, and it's not as fast as here, right? Here these bikes just zoom by you. There it's just a little assistance and irritating enough, my mom will accelerate from a traffic light faster than I will. <laughs> but it's, it's especially older people that are using the bike more often, keep using it and they go longer distances. Like my mom, will bike to her uh, sister who lives about 15 miles away. Yeah. And because it has the electric assistance, it's not a problem. All right, everybody bikes? Now I'm not assuming that you know who this is, but this is the prime minister of the Netherlands. So in the Netherlands, it's not unusual to see somebody in a suit uh, just riding the bike uh, to work. Uh, so that's the prime minister. All right, so the Dutch use the bike for everything. This is how you move your kids, right? And yes, that is six kids and one bike. You can do it. Um, they move it to, they use it for moving. I've done that. Uh, it's actually very easy, especially if you move within the city because you just put your stuff in there. You don't have to worry about all that much stuff and you make a couple of trips and you're done. Um, here's another person who is actually moving and that's in Amsterdam. Um, this is what I remember uh, when I grew up, where the local merchants are actually coming by with, per, with products. So this one is somebody who stands, but the baker would always come by with fresh bread every day, and the milkman would come by with milk. And that's how they moved. And it, it made a lot of sense because the streets are narrow and it works well, all right? And yes, this one too. <laughs> this, is, this is how I want to go. Oh my God. <laughs> My last trip will be by bike. <laughs> the shirt will have to be changed <laughs> under the ground. Um, but yeah, even that happens sometimes uh, by bike, right? So a bike is really much more integrated in anything than it is here. All right. So when people think about bikes, they always, here we always want to have better infrastructure. So I want to show you some of this better infrastructure, and then I want to show you that we can actually do things without all this expensive infrastructure. So here's some infrastructure uh, in the Netherlands, and it's pretty amazing stuff. Um, all right, here we go. We have heating elements in bike paths. Hmm. The reason for that is that in the winter, you don't have to worry about it being slippery. You can just keep on biking. We have garages for, and I will show you examples. So we have garages for bicycles uh, that are pretty state of the art. Uh, we have a green way for cyclists, not for cars, but for cyclists. So that actually when you bike at 15 miles an hour, you can keep the light will remain green for you. Uh, we have traffic lights that give cyclists, this is the fanciest one, I think, a green light more quickly and more often when it rains. Ah. Right, because a bike has more impact of rain than a car has, so if it's raining, we're going to make sure that the bikes get more often green lights. Uh, <laughs> photovoltaic service for generation of electricity. So far, it's mostly being used for light and art installations, but they're now starting to get to a point that they're actually really using for other things. And then traffic lights for bikes at crossroads, reserve turning lanes, and all kinds of things that you really start thinking about when you do this stuff. So here's some examples of this. This is the photovoltaic uh, bike path. Uh, and as you can see, it's really an art installation, but at the same time, it does serve a purpose because it does give you that light where the, where the bike path actually is. And you don't need the, the normal lights that you would normally need because it's the bike path that has the light on it. Um, so that's an installation that they have. Oh, here we go, bike parking. 
Has anybody ever tried in a transit center in downtown to go downstairs with your bike? It's a challenge, right? It's a 45 degree angle. You have to move your bike all the way to the side and it's almost impossible. For me, even it's almost impossible to do it. If you, especially if you use one of the green bikes, oh man, it's almost impossible to do it, right? Uh, here, now you just get onto the thing and you just get up and down that way. Uh, then this is how closely we park our bikes. Um, and as you can see, two, two layers. And if you think about it, even one layer, we have one bike that is low and the next one is a little higher, and the next one is low and the next one is a lot higher, which actually gives you way more storage space than if you have them all in the same space. All right, here is the bike uh, paths or the bike lanes that have the, uh, when it rains, right? So there's the little sensors. Here you see the little sensors in the road. If it's raining, the sky's raining, then the light will become green more often. There's some, something else that's really funny about this, and I don't want to show you this, but you see everybody has a green light at the same time. So, so in the Netherlands, the, so think about a bike versus a car. A bike actually clears an intersection much faster than cars do. So if you have 30 bikes that have to clear an intersection, that happens in like 30 seconds because you don't have time to, you don't need to accelerate, you basically are gone and everybody goes at the same time. The first car takes about 20 seconds from the moment that the light turns green until they clear the intersection. And then the other ones take about 10 seconds. So bikes will actually need a much shorter green light than cars do. So if you now make the green light for everybody at the same time, because they're all going at fairly low speeds, it's a little messy, but it clears the intersection really quickly. And I have videos that you can actually show you and it looks like a total disaster. But then when you look at it like, 25 seconds, the intersection is clear, all the bikes are gone. Um, What's that? What's that great thing on the inset on the one on the left? That the one? Sensor. That's the sensor for the rain. Built into the so it's built into the road. They have these sensors. If it rains, then the lights go green off more often yeah. for the bikes. I thought this was funny. You know, like my mom on her e bike, they actually have uh, this thing where you can charge your bike. Uh, so this is a bike charger. So you just put your bike near, just like we have for cars here, you, there you put your bike in there. And this to me is really cool. You know, I have one for my garage door that I can open with my phone. This is where you can check if your bike is locked. Uh, so it's actually an app on your phone and your, your, uh, uh, your lock is connected to it and you can lock it electronically. Why would you work? To make sure that you didn't forget to lock your bike, okay. <laughs> which I can tell you, I forget sometimes that I close my garage door. So it's actually kind of interesting, right? You can make sure your bike is locked. And also, if you're if your bike you have your bike locked somewhere and you want somebody else to use your bike, say, "Oh, let me open your bike, my bike for you. You can go with it." Right? So there's all kind of cool stuff with it. Besides, you know, bikes like like gadgets too. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I just think about them. Excuse I'm walking up, you know, and there's. But somebody else, and you're all of a sudden you're like, click, and the bike is opening up. It's kind of fun. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, here are all kind of different signals for bikes. Uh, and the interesting thing is that here, what it says is, we saw you. Uh, so it actually works. There are little cameras that can see that there are a bike. And they will say, okay, there is a bike now. So now we need to make sure the light turns green. And then there's another uh, sensor a little further down the road that if it gets beyond that point with bikes, they will make sure that the bikes can go because the line is too long. Um, here, this is a bike intersection. This is a rotunda. Uh, there's a couple of really interesting features about it. So the Dutch have realized that, so here's the bike path and it's right next to the road if you look carefully, right? So here's the road, here's the bike path. Here's a conflict, right, that is about to happen in this intersection. So what you do is, if there's a conflict about to happen, you separate the two modes of transportation. You separate the bike from the car so that you can actually see each other, right? So now you've separated each other now this bike, this car comes over here, right? Uh, if this bike would have to go this way, if they want, because this bike you actually can, they can see that bike coming from the side rather than, the bike is not next to you, it's actually coming right in front of you. So the bike doesn't have to follow the same traffic pattern that the cars follow in that road? They're supposed to. Oh. <laughs> but you know, but, but. but even if, if, if you think about it, right? So because everything is separated, this car can see this bike coming. Yeah. There is no weird conflict. It's all, it's the conflict is right in front of you. 
it's not somewhere on the side. There's not a bike that is all of a sudden passing you from the side or something. They have made clear there is all these unobstructed places. Now, the other thing, if I want you to look at this car, so you see how wide this thing is here? Uh -huh. The intention is that because this bike is biking here, this car can get off the rotunda and have enough space here to stop before that. That, that bike and let that bike go without oh. traffic, without but having how, a problem with them. Yeah. How many times does an intersection that well engineered and that large have so little traffic of both kinds? Because that doesn't look like, I mean, it looks like very little traffic. Yeah, I picked one with that little traffic, so it could actually show you how it works. Because I, I would imagine <laughs> yeah. that in real life it would look like an ant pile. No, there's actually not that much traffic on these intersections. If there's more traffic, they don't do this. Right? There, there can only be a certain amount of traffic because if there's really a lot of traffic, then this is not good enough. Okay. And they actually get a whole, and I'll show you a picture later on of a system that there's too much conflict and come up with something else. Um, this to me is a really interesting. This is a this is actually where I was close to where I was born. Um, this canal actually stopped effectively bikes from going from one side to the other, and it was a long way. So what they did is they built a bicycle bridge, a very narrow bridge that easily opens up, and then a pedestrian bridge that is higher. Uh, and the idea with the pedestrian bridge is that <laughs> there is actually quite some uh, boats driving by here or coming by, so that the pedestrian could always cross, right? Because it's high enough. That's why it looks so weird. It's high enough that the boat can go underneath. If but want, this one has to be closed. If you want to take a bike up over there, can you? You can, but it's, it, we're, we're talking <laughs> transit center <laughs> steep Just, now, okay? <laughs> but you could. So the, so the oh, oh, I see how it works. Very accessible. Like, other. For pedestrians, it's fine. Um, and, and just think about it, right? Yeah. This, the only reason that this is there is so that you can actually yeah. Yeah. go at any given time. That's true. But you know, this is not closed all the time. You know, this. But especially when there's a lot of these recreational boats, and when it's a beautiful spring day, you know, they can be open for quite a while. All right. This is what happens when you have a really busy intersection, right? So when you were talking about there's not a lot of traffic. So this is actually a hanging bridge. So this was really a complicated intersection. And they couldn't figure out how to do this and actually manage the, the, the problem. So they actually created this, this really beautiful hanging bridge where the, the bikes basically come up here and go over this hanging bridge. And there, there's no conflict with anything anymore. They have their own infrastructure. And this is what it looks like when you're on it. Now that's fancy infrastructure, right? That's obviously not. <laughs> that's not a kind of infrastructure that we will have, see anytime soon here, but it is really cool stuff. So that's what happens when you take it seriously. All right. But I want you to realize that bike infrastructure doesn't have to be fancy. So when I grew up, I remember these. They're, they're called mushrooms. And if you look at it, it is a wayfinding system completely based on bikes. Right? And so it tells you exactly in much more detail how far a place is. It's a place that you can only access that way by bike. A car should not follow these signs, but it doesn't mean that you can get there by car that way. Um, and, of course, they're down by the ground because if you're on a bike, your, your vision is there. It's not up there, right? So it's much more focusing on bikes. I, it always worked. That's how I got from one place to the other by looking at these things when I went somewhere. All right. I want to show you this one. Now we're going to have to try out and see if the sound works. Uh, this is a high-speed intercity route, and we call them cycle highways for long distance commuters. The central railway station in Nijmegen is now connected to the one in Arnhem by an 18 kilometer high speed cycleway. The first two kilometers are on the Snelbinder cycle bridge over the river Waal, at the foot of which there is a sign telling you it is still 16 kilometers to Arnhem. Arnhem. She's right, it will be fine. Look at the wide cycleway, far away from motor traffic. The route takes you to perfect overpasses and wide tunnels 
One of which has an art installation of lights in the form of bicycle chains, for which there is an app for your smartphone that allows you to choose your favorite colors to be shown while you ride in the tunnel. Speaking of lights, the whole route is lit with specially designed light fixtures, also in the shape of a bicycle chain. The logo of this route called Rijnwaalbad. The route is very clear, even where you have to make turns. You can simply follow the red carpet of smooth asphalt, even when it winds through a village along the route. A very nice village, I might add. When things get a bit more complicated, there are signs, sometimes with a number, sometimes with the name of the end destination, but always clear. Most of the intersections are also very clear. And most of the time people cycling have priority, which is given by the majority of drivers. <laughs> A few major intersections are different. Here you have to yield when you are cycling. But that never really takes more than a few seconds, after which you can safely continue on your journey. I think this situation is to be preferred over this not so clear intersection with priority for cycling in Bemmel. Even though it has warning signs for drivers, the turn is unexpected. I was lucky there was no approaching traffic in this instance. So let's look what happens to other people. This woman gives a very clear signal. But no, the driver does not let her go first. It is a good thing she was careful. This is the worst intersection in the entire route, in my opinion. Which doesn't render it bad, of course. The rest of the route is wonderful. It takes you past cornfields, sunflowers, and apple trees. He's very excited. No wonder all types of people cycling want to use this cycleway. <clears throat> Even if you are very exposed to the fierce Dutch winds. Some points will have to be improved later. This should have been an underpass. For the time being, you have to make a slight detour to cross a road and then go back to the original route again. The route has several works of art, such as this halfway point. There are also references to World War II. This lock was defended by the Irish Guards in Operation Market Garden. So the bridge right there was named after them. One branch of the cycle route ends at a very famous bridge, now named John Frostbrug, at the edge of the Arnhem city centre. It was the bridge too far in the failed operation to end the war for the Netherlands. Another branch of the cycle route goes past Arnhem's football stadium to a different bridge to cross the River Rhine. The rivers at the beginning and end give the cycle route its name, Rijnwaalpad, a perfect route for cycling from Arnhem to Nijmegen and vice versa. So to me this one was interesting because it's bike is really for intercity, right? For or in between in one city, and this is really where they're trying to make a connection between two major cities. And there are two major cities that are very hard to reach because there are these rivers in between them. So this was really an attempt to fix that. I want to show you that because, you know, here we have these signs for bikes and you can barely see them, this white paint that is kind of sitting on there. This is the way they do paint. And this is what is called a, um, a bike street and the car is a guest. So they don't separate necessarily traffic. They said this is designed for bikes and as a car, you're a guest.
which means you cannot go faster than 20 miles per hour. And you're, you can see the surface of the street, right? It's not exactly to go fast. It's really designed for the bike. They also have pedestrian streets where the bike can be a guest. They have car streets where the bike can be a guest. And they have all these kind of different, they're all designed differently. Yeah. All right. That doesn't mean all is perfect because, you know, it's kind of easy to brag about all the stuff. So I'll show you some stuff that is messed up. This is actually where I went to college, Wageningen. And I've stood in this intersection many, many a time. So the problem here, of course, is that there's so many students that are all going to class at the same time that you have, and it's really a very long line of bikes that are sitting there. Uh, now, think about it, though. If you would be in a car, you would have to really build some additional road here, right? Uh, because those here, there's the six cars sitting here, and they're sitting next to each other. Look, that's just this amount of bikes. <laughs> Um, all right, so that's a problem. This has always been a problem. <laughs> There's bikes everywhere, and there used to be bikes really everywhere. It's becoming a little bit less. They're much more organized about it now, but it's it's almost like, I don't know, <laughs> street garbage after a while, right? There's so many. They're everywhere. Um, How do you, like, get to your bike? Oh, you figure it out. <laughs> uh, it, it's funny because people say, like, well, how do you know where your bike is? Well, what, what if you're in Costco and you're parking... Costco, you know where your car is, right? There's all these cars, and the bike is the same way. You know? And typically, when you park somewhere, a lot of times, you always kind of park in the same spot, right? You put your bike almost always in the same spot where creatures have happened. Well, you get parked in a little easier on there. Yeah. And, you know, you have to move. The most vulnerable part on the bike is actually when you park it, and it's the cables that are coming from your brakes um, because people pull out their bike and the cable breaks. Um, I thought this was actually interesting. This was not in the Netherlands, it's in Belgium. And as you can see, it's very recent. It was a couple of weeks ago, I believe, in April. 1,100 tickets uh, were written for traffic infractions against weaker road users. Right? So they consider a bike and a pedestrian a weaker road user. So here's a car that is parked in the bike lane, and he gets ticket. Can you imagine 1,100 tickets? I think that's just amazing that they actually have a campaign against. Let's make sure that people don't do that stuff anymore. All right. This is problematic. <laughs> so the intent is that you have this because here's the road and here's the bike. We need to have some more separation. So you put these things in there. And I don't know what the guy was thinking. <laughs> you, you would assume that when he was building it, he could see that he put the poles in the wrong place. but didn't obviously um, this is the shortest bike path in the Netherlands All right so here it says bike path and here it says bikes are not allowed so it's, it's about one bike um, all right so what if a Dutch guy starts biking to work in Boise so I use my pivot head little uh, camera and uh, wanted to show people what it means if I bike to work right so I live here, near the botanical gardens, and this is where we are right now, the water center. I have three alternative ways that I can get there, and I can be more creative and come up, come up with a couple of other ones. Uh, so the first one is where I take the green belt, I go down the green belt, I go alongside and Morrison Park, or not and Morrison Park, uh, Municipal Park, and then I end up on Park Center and I get to work. Right? That's the first alternative. And here is what it looks like. And I, I'm not showing you much of the green belt, but here. This is an easy intersection from that side because you can see traffic fairly good from both sides. And most people actually stop there. <laughs> if you come from the other side, it's not, not quite as safe and easy. And anybody who is here see nodding, so you know this, you know it will happen next. Right, so, I just take this up. so you're really comfortable, right? And yeah. The only problem with the pivot head is you can hear it. Yeah. The sound. Is it? Oh. Thanks. Yeah. 
Yeah, you're, sorry. <laughs> so, so it became a little narrower, and and the pivot head is here is really funny, right? Because now I can show people. Oops. And and then, even if I can't really get on the road because there is no way to get on the road. And of course, if you look at that, that's really not a safe place to be biking on the road. And you see how fast those cars are coming. And I bike pretty fast, but um, I would never. I know you do it, Diana, but I would not go on. Park center, park center there, especially there where, the, where they come around the corner and there's nothing there and they go really fast. Um, but so now I'm staying there nicely. But now I actually have another problem here because the trees are too low. Sounds familiar, right? So you hit your head a couple of times. I turned the sound off so you can't hear the bonk. <laughs> <laughs> Otherwise, you would hear this. <laughs> um, actually, a little further away. Of course, here there is another interesting thing where the bike, where the pedestrian walkway goes much closer to the road, and this is where the trees are too low. Do you stay on the sidewalk if there's pedestrians coming your way? I, I usually do. Uh, there is just no way to jump off there, even on my mountain bike. I mean, yeah. I'm worried if I'm if I jump off that I fall and. Crossed by a car that's coming by. Do you by. stop for the pedestrian? And I, yeah, I go really slow and wait. And um, all right, now I get, of course, here where this car is standing. Now my light is green. Of course, that car is not going to stop. And now I have to really stop first because I. And here's the problem, right? I I'm on the sidewalk. My light is green, but that car that is coming has no way if I'm going to turn or that I'm going to go the other way. And then you know, again, I really have no other choice. It's really interesting that if you looked at the other side, it actually said bike path ends. Right. So the thing with this is that 75% of my ride is comfortable. The last 25% is messed up. Right. So I have alternatives. So this was the first. So the the second alternative is that I got take the green belt all the way, and instead of taking the shortcut, I go all the way. I go to Ram, which is here, and then I go on to Broadway. Now, I'm not going to show, I'm sure you understand this is a very pleasant ride, so I'm going to just show you what happens when I get on Broadway. So I'm on Broadway now. I've, I've made that little jump there. I actually want to turn. Yeah, that's all. That's good. Okay. The reason I like to have the sound on it because I want you to realize I can actually hear the traffic. I have food that's like this for me in the car. I have the radio on and I'm totally isolated from traffic right We're on the bike here. So now I have to cross and I can, you can see on the other side there's the bike path, right It's nicely indicated there. But I have to go to this building. So somehow I'm going to have to make myself go to the left hand side. And I would actually if I do this correctly, I have to cross two lanes of traffic to get on the outside left hand turn line. And as you can see, I can do it. I'm trying, now getting too close to uh, Front Street, I can't really make that turn anymore, I think I'm going to look back one more time to see if I potentially could do it here. I realized, yeah, I can't do it. And now look what happens, I'm still looking around like, oh, I can't go anywhere. <laughs> so now at the last moment I have to jump um, the sidewalk and that car I guess I didn't oh. hear this. That car actually freaked out because I was going, and all of a sudden I had to go to the right because I couldn't really go anywhere else anymore. It's not the car's fault. He has no expectation for me to all of a sudden have to jump on the sidewalk, but I really didn't have another choice either. And then, of course, here I'm just going to cross at the sidewalk and go to the other side again. That works perfectly fine. All right. So here's the alter last alternative. And the last alternative is that I take um, Warm Springs all the way down and then turn on to uh, Broadway here. And I don't think it's called Broadway here. It's called, is it still called Avenue B there? No, Broadway. Is it Broadway? Right. So I can tell you this is all pretty comfortable. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to pick it up while I'm getting around here so that you don't have to see my entire ride. Um,
And somebody got hit there, uh, I think yesterday, by somebody who opened their door. So I was going to say, the kind of comfortable, I'm going to call it pretty comfortable, almost 60% of the world not did as well. But you could see, right? Now all of a sudden, I see how small that side was. And now I have to turn left. Right? I have to get somehow in that left-hand turning lane in order for me to make that turn. So here I go. I'm a pretty aggressive bike driver, so I don't care. Right? And, and this is really, OK, see how narrow that is? And I should probably have stayed behind, but that doesn't make any sense. And now, actually, the scary part comes pretty soon. But then that light actually turns in an orange flashing light. And as you can see, when that happens, I really have no choice but to kind of go. But now, as a bicyclist, I'm going to be standing right in the middle there. And I feel very vulnerable at that moment. What, what am I supposed to do? Where am I supposed to go? I'm standing in the middle on my bike. Um, see, here's the, see, there's the flashing light. That car is going. Um, can't really just stay there and wait, so I'm kind of going with him. And I kind of anticipate to go. But now look what interesting thing that I'm going here. Now I have to make sure that that car doesn't hit me, right? Uh, and meanwhile, some of these people immediately go to the right, right? So I'm kind of stuck there. Now I'm actually not going to my work at this point because I wanted to see what it looks like if I go continue. Because you will, you will see, right? There is no bike path here, so it's gone. <laughs> I mean, there's nothing. Uh, I could probably have jumped on the sidewalk here, but I didn't want to do that. I, I wanted to try to actually be a real bicyclist and a real road user. So I'm looking back now because now if I want to go straight, I have to go a little bit to that lane, right? Which effectively means now if somebody passes me on the right, that's kind of scary. Mm -hmm. Then there it goes, right? See how close that car is. Um, now I have to stand here. And, and now you can see, well, there's a nice little bike path there, right? Where did that come from? I'm sorry? Where'd that come from? <laughs> this is actually much more fun with her sound on, but. So have you shown this to ACHD by any chance? So yesterday or last week I showed it and they saw some of the things that were in there and they're now actually gonna do pedestrian counts there. They're gonna look at some of the other stuff. Hmm. Uh, but now here's the interesting thing, right? So I'm on this bike path, I'm really comfortable. Now, remember where I showed you the rotunda where I said, if traffic gets closer, you know, if there's a conflict coming, you want to separate. Now look what we're doing here. First of all, that thing is still there. It has been there now for, for six weeks. It just sits there. Um, but now I'm getting to a place where there's a potential conflict, right? There's an intersection. And look what they do. They do exactly the wrong thing. They bring me as a bike closer to the traffic. Sure where they should have separated me to bring me closer. And of course, this, this is the only time that I've ever done this. Because I think this is just one of the most bizarre yeah. places where, and I, what I'm actually worried about is yeah. not so much the car in front of me, but the car behind me that might be accelerating to get in and that might hit me. Because they don't have uh, to yield right. 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 So anyway, so there is really no way, I can make that last piece of my commute work, right? There is just no way to do it right. Um, so, some other things. I, I was trying to show some other things. So I'm like, you know, let's let's go get lunch and see how that works from this water center. You guys have done this, right? So there's a free ride turn that I need to negotiate. And by the way, the, light, the flashing light is not working right now. Um, I called ACHD and told them about it. So we're going to see how quickly they have fixed it. But the, the light is not working. Uh, I also told them that the sign is <coughs> wrong. The sign is for some reason facing the pedestrian rather than the car, which is bizarre. All right, so free ride and turn, and there's a car-oriented pedestrian crossing, and there are three additional conflicts if I want to make my way to Whole Foods. All right, so here we go. So you're like going across the street here. I'm going across the street here, yes. <laughs> Basically. In this case, I think I can leave the light, because I think it's important that you can hear the traffic, right? It makes a difference. So here's the first. The light was still working, but you can see. See that sign? That's wrong. It's facing the wrong way. It should have been facing the traffic, telling traffic that it's so why is there no paint there? Wait, why is there no clear mark thing? Now I'm getting here, these cars are coming, it's fine. Push the button, all is fine. I think something funny is about to happen. One of the major problems with this intersection. Here, look at that car. <laughs> and it happens all the time. People that use a free ride and turn to cross straight to the whole thing.
So, so the interesting thing with this is, right, this, and I'm going to show you how you can fix a lot of these things. The design itself is not that bad. It's just they don't have a clear place where you need to stop. Stop here when the light is flashing. Why doesn't it say that? Well, you know, and people don't, under, and there's a lot of stuff in this design that doesn't make sense to people. All right, so let's continue. Okay, he, he should have moved all the way to there. Right. Yeah. And it's sort of a stop bar. So now the interesting thing is, look how I'm crossing here. So you would say there's a conflict, right? So there's a conflict. So what I should be doing is cross the shortest distance. But instead, I'm crossing this way because that's the way that the road is built. But I'm actually on the road much longer than I need to be. It doesn't make any sense. And then the other thing I want you to know is notice how small this is. Yeah. Somebody probably thought that concrete was not available or something. And you can see this bike just barely gets through there, right? All right, so now I have to turn. Because there's a whole thing, right? So here's my first conflict. This is a very awkward conflict because I can't see the cars coming because they're behind me, right? So I need to turn around to actually see if there's anything there. Of course, I have to also be careful with the car that's making a free ride and turn. Here's the next conflict. This guy stops. Now you would say that's about enough conflict, but Whole Foods decided in their wisdom to create one more conflict. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to let, let it go for a second because once I stand on the corner, I'm actually looking back, and then you can see how many people are taking that turn into Whole Foods. So what's here? See how many cars are coming in? And as a pedestrian who is walking this way, I would not have seen that conflict. I would not have seen them because they're right behind me. All right, so that's all the conflicts that Whole Foods gives me. Um, what am I trying to show here? All right, so what could I have done differently? Walk. Sorry? Walk. <laughs> But, but I mean, just think about it, right? This is not hard to solve. This is just poor. I have to say, I, I hate free right hand turns, but this one actually is okay. It's a lot safer than it used to be. I mean, when we, we wouldn't be able to cross before, now we can actually go. So the first thing is, why do we have this weird sign basically pointing at nothing? Why don't we point it a little bit more forward and tell me where to stop? Because as a car, you have no idea where to stop. You have no idea, there's no paint. Right? That's the other thing. Let's put some paint on that. So it's actually clear as a car where I'm supposed to stop and what I'm supposed to do. And then, you know, that sign is supposed to show that pedestrian crossing. But it's pointed the wrong way. It has, and it has been like that for a while. I called them about it. They didn't do anything about it. Now I left them an email message, so we'll see if it, they fix it. Um, but again, think about this, right? Where this pole is, it's behind where the pedestrian was supposed to cross. Why don't we put that a little earlier so that we know where we need to stop? That, that's yeah. signs for cars. Right. It's not for you walking across. What, what is it telling me then? It's not telling you anything. It's telling the car. That's... Right, but it should tell the car before the, before the conflict comes, right? right. It, should tell, it should tell the car there are pedestrians, potentially pedestrians crossing. It shouldn't tell me that, oh, there were pedestrians crossing. I wasn't sure. Yeah, now that, my point with this is you need to move them forward so that as a car, I know there's a conflict coming and there should be a very clear line here that says when there are car, it says turning vehicle yield. Well, yield where? 
yield at this line. Make me sure that I know where, where the people will need to line. So the point with this is it's not the car's fault. It's the way it's designed. It's designed wrong. All right, so here, this is the intersection that I just think is ridiculous. Why do we keep people on the road longer than they need to be? Um, and, you know, this is what people do. <laughs> We're not stupid. We'll take the shortcut. And especially if we have to go to Whole Foods, we're just going to go to cross, cross straight. Uh, it goes faster. All right. Going back to work. Three more conflicts. Poorly placed sign. And most importantly, drivers that look away from me by design. So here is the, the, the situation. So here I'm leaving Whole Foods, right? You see how nice and narrow that class is for me to walk, right? So now I have to cross, now I have to turn around. And did you notice that sign? See, this person should have stopped. But that person is looking that way. If I, I should actually stop, I should show you where she's looking at. Oh. Where did I go? Did I go the wrong way? Yeah. So let me show you this again and then pause it right at that point. Again, there's no way that this car could have seen me. I went too far. Where? There we go. I want to show you this woman. No, not this woman. The one before that. Sorry. Person in the white car. Look where she's looking. Yeah. Right? C is not worried about me. C is worried about that traffic. And that's the way it's designed. I need to look to see if I can go, not realize that there might be the pedestrian that I hadn't seen because of the sign first. And now I'm not worried about the pedestrian anymore. I'm already blocking the pedestrian, and I'm just waiting until I can actually go in. Yeah. Well, if you stop back by that big white line where you're supposed to, you can't see anything. There is that sign. Well, no. Actually, if you stop at the correct place, you can see because the only thing that you care about. Well, no, you're right. You, you can, but you can see the traffic, but you cannot see me. Yeah. So. Right. So I actually talked with several people about this, and. The, they see the conflict as where the car comes out on the road, and then there has to be a certain angle of seeing. The conflict is not where the pedestrian is, and that's why the sign is actually allowed there. Right, so you need to have a certain angle of viewing things, but they see the conflict as when you enter the roadway rather than when you see the pedestrian. If you would do it where you see the pedestrian, that sign should have been removed and could not have been there. All right, so let's look at this. This is what I thought was really hilarious. There's not even a stop sign. When you get out of Whole Foods, there is no stop sign anywhere. It just tells you a slow pedestrian crossing. Oh. And there is some paint, of course, right? There is some paint here that says stop. But other than that, it says slow pedestrian crossing. And that was only placed after somebody was hit. Okay. Um, and then here's the sign that obviously is completely blocking that pedestrian that is coming, that is designed to walk there, right? The pedestrian is supposed to go there, and you can't see him or her. So what do you do? Let's put a stop sign there, because I'm looking for cheap solutions. There are actually better solutions, but put a stop sign there. Uh, that sign could actually easily be moved from here to the other side here. That's all it takes. That is not going to have any major impact on the businesses here but it will immediately clear the vision. It's that simple. It was just poorly designed. All right, I'm going to pick a little bit more on them. I was really planning on driving through Boise, but it was just not necessary, unfortunately. All right, this is... Why is that ITV? Sorry? Why is that ITV? I'm just kind of standing here. Look at that car that's coming here. No vision of me until it has crossed. It can't see me. That thing is again on the right, on the wrong spot. Now look at this car here. What you're supposed to do as a car is go around. Look at this one. So I actually do it the correct way as a car, right? So I do this way and then I go around. The idea here is that before there is a conflict with this bike, you turn the car around. The design, the principle is correct. You turn around as a car so that the conflict is right in front of you rather than the side. The fact that they 
are too cheap to put paint on here means that nobody understands what they're supposed to do. And I've actually been in here as a car doing this and got almost sideswiped by a car that went this way. Uh, you have it too? And, and you know, paint would do it, but you could also maybe just raise it a little bit and actually put, maybe just put some planters on there, make it actually look good. Um, and there was easy ways that this could have been resolved. And it's already there, right? It's, it doesn't cost anything else. It's just, it's, the design is correct. Now make sure that people understand how it works. All right. In case you think that car was an exception, um, how we do that on all the There's one. <coughs> two. I do that all the time. Three. And, and people just don't know. It's just poorly designed. It's not clear what you need, to, what you're supposed to do. So. Oh, I have a question on that. If you if you want to make a turn into that parking lot and somebody is coming by in the bike lane, do you just stop in the road? Yeah. Well, and, and there is actually enough space here, right? There should be enough space that you could almost stop there and that ever the traffic could be around you. You think that's that will, you think that's enough there that I'm not gonna get it. I, I I actually think it probably is. Yeah. And you can just stop and run. There's nothing wrong with it. Well, the she behind me. Me. Hit me when well, I stop. you've got to have your turn signal on and your brake lights on, obviously. And then it's the guy behind you is fault. Oh. I, I would add there's more flaws to this, and that is we have this penchant for throwing bike lanes in little bits and pieces of places wherever we can. So this happened. The reason this, these bike lanes are here and the reason they stop where they stop is because when they redesigned Broadway, the, the bridge. Um, they said, well, let's put bike lanes in here. But they have, because because it's ITD, it stops at front. Mm -hmm. So they put in bike lanes mm -hmm. front. Mm -hmm. Well, first of all, these cars do this not just because of the design. They do it because there's almost never any bikes there. 90% of the bikes are biking on Broadway, because even with this design, they still don't feel safe when they're on the sidewalk. And so one of the disservices I think that we do is we don't put good thought into your larger topic, which is real infrastructure for bikes. And so we throw this stuff out there, but you know, if you drive through there and go to Whole Foods three or four times a week and you've never seen a bike there, of course you're not going to be thinking about that bike lanes for bikes. You know, why would you? You've never seen a bike in it. Plus it's really not clear. I I notice I don't drive very much. I usually am on my bike. But the first time I saw that from a driver's perspective, I didn't even, I thought, I, for some reason, I thought that that sort of island between was actually the bike lane. And then all of a sudden I saw the green part and I went, what, wait, wait. I, I was totally confused because right. it's not clear. What, and it's very unfamiliar right. you know, to us and they don't do stuff consistently. Right. They should have candled it at, at a minimum just yeah. to tell bike cars you can't do. Oh, and, but the point is, like, so they've actually tried to do it right, right? And they got the design okay, but the execution isn't comfortable enough. I, I don't go there as a bike. I'm sorry. I'm just not going to do it. Um, I drove there once to take the video. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, yeah, but so, and then, so let's, let's look at this, right? So the first thing that I need to fix is, what about the stop sign there, maybe? You now that you're supposed to stop here? Huh. Of course, if you stop here, then this thing is blocking any kind of vision, right? You can't see anything, but you could do that. That's the first thing you could do. You uh, maybe could rid of, get rid of that sign, and maybe we should start realizing that that line of sight needs to be from the conflict, not from where you meet the next car. Um, and maybe some paint there or candles or something you know because it's unclear and then you know while we're at it put some real paint there <laughs> not this kind of faded stuff uh and let's get rid of that thing there oh. uh because that has been there now for quite a while <coughs> all right why do i have that that shouldn't be in there <laughs> I'm supposed not to be there uh, the, the, the point though with this is that yes. you can do these things differently right you can this is actually not a bike path this is a road for cars. Uh, bikes are, but, but cars are the guest. It's mostly for bikes. All right. So this is not my la latest presentation. So I was trying to show you 
what else do you think is wrong with these things? There's a fundamental flaw in the way we think about this. And, and Matt Edmonds actually pointed it out to me. So it's the problem is here, uh, not here. The problem is here. It's here. What do you see? Forget a red line, the red things there. You see somebody standing there too, with a sign. Sure, sure. Okay. Probably true. Anybody see? I see lots of. Well, I think of how you mentioned with the crosswalk, how it's designed with the road, and rather than the design with like how short of a distance it would be for the pedestrians. So I okay. think it's along the lines of this is all built for the car first, and then we kind of work around it, which is a really logical way. Of building pedestrian ways. So let me see, let me try to get the best picture of where I come in. Could probably make the point best here. So why have we treated this as, uh, as if the pedestrian is intruding on the car? It's the other way around. As a car, you are intruding on my right way. I'm walking here. What we should have done is this concrete should have continued all the way through and it should have become really clear that as a cart you are intruding on my terrain on my walkway not the other way around yeah but this is i know i know <laughs> i've never seen concrete continue through but but it's it sends the wrong message to the driver right it sends to the, it tells to the driver this is my stuff mm -hmm. look there's even this big yellow barrier you're supposed to stop there well, the reality is, no, you're a car, you're intruding on my space, not the other way around. Um, all right, so let's go back here. And see, it's the same thing. Well, this is the same intersection. So They, they couldn't even go one step further there because there's enough room. They could keep the crosswalk raised yeah. and make it more of a drive into it. And mm -hmm. that's what I would suggest that they do. All right, so yeah. there's things that you can easily do here. And that's, you know, here, mm -hmm. the, the point of this is that it can show you with the way your surface is, it really makes an impact. Uh, as you can see here, here was it is, here's the road. But it seems like this is the road, right? It's very clear here that these guys have to ride away and you as a car better stop. And it's just the way that you design it. It's clear. Same thing here with this intersection, right? Look, this goes on and it makes it clear for this car that no, this is the road, and I am intruding on that service, not the other way around. The other thing that they've done there, which the whole place should have done, um, is they've pulled it way back, and so you've got that car space. So now right. what you have is the car waits and looks at only the bike pad facility. They don't have to think about cars and bikes and pads. So first they look at that user, then that car can cross through. Right. These guys don't have to think about them, and now they can just look at the cars. Right. And they could have done that really easily at Whole Foods yep. if they'd taken that landscaping strip and made it wider and pushed the, the crosswalk back. They could have had enough room to move that stupid sign. And you first had to see, oh, right. here's the sidewalk, there's bikes, pads, then get out, look at the cars. So, so the point about this, when I showed you all that fancy infrastructure, a lot of this it doesn't have to be fancy. You just have to think about it for a second. Think about how it works and what will work and what will not work. Uh, so, and this is a bad example, right? Uh, where it is clear that this, this is the car, and this is, I am now intruding on the car. Um, and and the, the road surface really tells you what it looks like. Um, okay, see, here were my examples. This is where I was going to ask you. So, what's wrong with these? So, I had my slides in the wrong order. Uh, and here, the same thing, right? Uh, and, and, and this one, to me, is the most pronounced one, where you're a car, and then it just says entrance. You don't even realize that you're going to be intersecting with the pedestrian here. But it should have been, this should have continued, this bike path or this, this pedestrian area, and then it should have become clear that I'm all of a sudden going somewhere else. And then this probably should not have been as close to each other. All right. <laughs> I, I have to say, Merle and Broadway, I mean, it's like, they just painted it. <laughs> Um, but uh, really, is this a good idea? So here is Myrtle. And so the free right hand turn here in the corner, I don't like it, but I have to admit it's safer than it was before. But when you think about it, I'm coming this way, the car has to make more of a 90 degree turn to make that turn. On top of that, there is a building sitting there. 
So what happens is cars have to slow down. They think about that. Front and, or Myrtle and uh, Broadway, this is less, you know, this is what, 120 degree turn? There has not been a traffic light from, I don't know, 6th Street on. That's the last thing. So these cars are going full speed. They have no sense of obstruction and they just go and then here's the poor guy on his bike. And I stayed there to watch him and he made it. But if that car had accelerated more, he would have been hit from back. And the car does not look ahead. They look behind them because they want to get in. Uh, so it's just really a dangerous place. Then the other stupid thing here, I'm going to show you this. This drives me absolutely insane. <laughs> look at the placement of this thing. I'm coming here, right? I want to cross, but I now first I have to walk all the way to the side there to push the button. Basically telling somebody, this guy is not going to cross. He's going to keep on walking and then he cross it. And a lot of these, really, the thing where you push the button is a long place. It's just silly. Um, all right. This is way longer than I thought. All right. So it's high speed, free flowing, unobstructed right hand turn. Uh, I would say the only solution here is don't allow a free right hand turn. Just make sure that you can do it. Um, and then you should realign the pedestrian crossing so that it's the shortest way. But that's where I'm, I'm willing to negotiate a free right hand turn here. There <laughs> should not be a free right hand turn on Myrtle and Broadway. It is just absolutely, it's, it's a matter of time that somebody gets hit there and it's, it's going to be serious. All right. I just think this is so funny. This is a cross, you know. I, I don't know why they made it so so thin. I have seen wheelchairs, at least the, some of the electric ones, at least as wide. Right. Really. It's exactly the minimum size. I said, okay. So, so tight. We should have a pedestrian turn uh, counter here now in the next couple of days. And then um, CCDC is actually going to try to convince ACHD to change it and, and just fix this because it's ridiculous. It's too silly. All right. Um, I was in a meeting, Matt and Matt Edmund and uh, Darren Fluke came here to the building and talked about bike design. <laughs> and it was the first time that I wasn't around just people that love bikes. Yeah, there were actually people that don't like bikes and want to have in their car. Um, and, and then I realized that there is actually a way that even if you don't like bikes, that you can show people that it is in their best interest, right? Because this is how many, six bikes take this much space in, and this is obviously not a Dutch way of parking. We know how big expensive parking is here and how difficult it is to find a parking spot. Uh, and this is how much space six cars take in that downtown parking garage. So anytime they can get anybody in this building to take a bike, there will be more parking. Okay. I think that's more than enough. I talk way longer than I expected. So sorry that I didn't tell about, I could have talked about the history of the bike. That would have been fun. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. So now we're going to have to go outside and see if they fix the light. I called it in at 2 o'clock. <laughs> oh, you saw it. Yeah. Yeah. I called it in at 2, so I'm curious to see if they fixed it yet. How long has the pet light been down? I noticed that. This, this afternoon at 2 o'clock. That's the first.